uh, Thomas Lindsay, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Marilee. Where's Marilee? Where did she go? Oh, back there. She's uh, tied to be my favorite elected official in the United States <laughs> that we've worked with. The first one is uh, John Olivas, who's uh, chairman of the Mora County Commissioners in New Mexico. Uh, Mora County was the first county in the United States to adopt a ordinance banning hydrocarbon extraction within their county and uh, got sued for it promptly by the uh, Oil and Gas Association in New Mexico. So uh, they don't let me out much anymore. Uh, we're very busy. Uh, we're headed to the Yukon Territory at the end of September to help uh, First Nations and some municipal governments in Yukon. Uh, who found the Colorado Initiative 75 language and called us up and want to do something similar in the Yukon, of all places. So, yeah. yep. so uh, I got out of the cage of the office uh, last week, went to New Hampshire, uh, in a little place called Nottingham, New Hampshire, which is in the central part of the state. They successfully beat uh, one of the largest water bottling corporations in the United States, who was trying to put in a water bottling operation that would have used up about 40,000 gallons a week uh, to bottle water and then send it overseas uh, for sale. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that uh, they had a permit burning party. The state of New, New Hampshire had issued a groundwater extraction permit to the corporation. It lasts 10, 10 years. So 10 years for these permits given. And they can be sold and transferred and all these other things. They, forced, they passed a rights-based ordinance, similar to the one adopted in Lafayette, except it dealt with corporate water extraction, corporate water bottling operations. Held the corporation off for 10 years till the permit expired, and then had to get together last weekend to actually physically burn the permit. So they took each page of the permit, and they lit it up, and they put it in a little ash can. Everybody participated from the community. It was just a very cleansing event, I think, in some ways. <laughs> but in, in, in sitting there watching all this happen, two things. Number one, it struck me about how easy it was for the state to issue a 10-year permit to take water. Right? The permit is boilerplate on some lawyer's computer uh, at the Department of Environmental Quality, you know, the state agency. They just flip in a couple of names and numbers, and then it just runs off the printer. And as soon as it comes off the printer, it's a 10-year permit to extract water. It took the folks in Nottingham, even though 70% of the people in Nottingham were opposed to the water extraction, it took them 10 years to burn the permit, right? And an extraordinary amount of work. They had to you know, appeal driveway permits and uh, send the rights-based ordinance that they had adopted. Uh, to all the creditors who were trying to take over the corporation, because the corporation eventually was forced into bankruptcy. Non-stop 10 years worth of organizing, right? People had to put their lives on hold for 10 years to chase down all these leads and to enforce the, the rights-based ordinance, to elect new people to their council. You know, endless or amount of organizing, endless amount of hours. It took the state five minutes to issue the thing, and it took them 10 years to kill it, right? I don't want to live in that kind of country, right? That's why I was saying to myself, whispering to myself as I was sitting there, that it was so easy to do it and so hard to actually restore and protect what people wanted to protect in Nottingham. And the other thing that happened was, was a little funnier than that, because that's pretty dark, but uh, you know, one of good friends of ours got up, one of the key leaders in the fight against the water bottling plant, and uh, he gave a little speech at the beginning before he burned the permit, and he said, he said, I'm proud to be a despicable person. And everybody was like, what's he talking about, right? Well, about a year ago, the lawyers for the Water Bottling Corporation stood in front of bankruptcy court and asked the judge to shield their financial records and everything else that the corporation had from the people in Nottingham who were taking the information and sending the rights-based ordinance out to corporations that were trying to buy or come out of bankruptcy. And the lawyer pointed to them in open court, and he said, these are despicable people, right? And so this guy stood up and said, I'm happy to be a despicable person. I went up and gave a talk, and I said, I'm happy to be with despicable people. Uh, just uh, this afternoon, we had a meeting of the Community Rights Network of Colorado, the Colorado Community Rights Network, which I'm going to talk about later. And I, I, I'm proud to be with despicable people as well, because we had 60 or 70 despicable people in the room. 
So uh, I talked about how busy we are. Uh, you know, everybody's busy, but we're busier now than we've been the last uh, 12 years. Uh, and the reason is that everything's pretty much fucked, right? From top to bottom. Uh, we know it. The political system is cooked. The regulatory process is cooked. Uh, basically, remedies that we would normally exercise to protect our communities are pretty much cooked. People are starting to understand that, finally. You know, in the beginning when we were doing this work, it was really difficult to have a conversation about that because people said, well, you know, we're activists and we appeal permits and we beg and plead our congressmen to do X uh, and we buy Priuses and we replace our light bulbs and we do all those good things that people are supposed to do. Uh, we don't understand disobedience or we don't understand when things don't work through those existing outlets that have been provided. And finally, as things get worse, people have begun to understand more and more about uh, how the system is tanked and why we need to actually create a new one, uh, which, I, which is what I'm here to talk about tonight. So we didn't start way back in 1995 with getting on a plane to Nepal and helping the Nepalese folks out with a new constitution or to Ecuador and helping them out with a new constitution or even traveling to Colorado to help folks draft ordinances and go through legal processes. We actually started out back in 1995 in law school in central Pennsylvania with communities coming to us asking for help in fighting projects that they didn't want in their community. So toxic waste incinerators and factory farms and land applied sewage sludge uh, and regular landfills and all kinds of stuff that comes into communities on a daily basis that people don't want. They were coming to us, weirdly, as we were law students, and they were coming to us because legal services today are outrageously and prohibitively expensive. Uh, some of my environmental law colleagues, my peers, uh, charge upwards of $2,000 an hour uh, to assist community organizations. So if you're a small community organization in rural Pennsylvania, you can't afford $2,000 an hour. Barely have two dimes to rub together, or quarters to rub together. And people say, oh, well, there are pro bono lawyers out there, environmental interest pro bono lawyers. Well, the numbers today are almost the same as when I graduated, which is there's only 200 full-time public interest environmental lawyers in the United States today, 200. And uh, so going through law school, we were taught at least that the problem was not the laws themselves. After all, you know, my environmental law professors would tout that we have the best environmental laws in the world. So the laws aren't the problem, then what's the problem? Well, they would say that we don't have enough enforcement of those laws, or not enough people care about the natural environment, so they're not using those laws. But the problem aren't, isn't the laws themselves, the problem is actually people don't have the resources to exercise those laws. And so when we graduated from law school, we decided to create the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which is the organization I work for. The purpose of CELDEF back then was quite simple, because we thought it was a simple problem, which was to provide lawyers to community groups. After all, if community groups can't afford lawyers, the solution is to provide lawyers to community groups. If the laws aren't the problem, and the problem is not enough people are using the system or don't have the resources to use the system, then we need to provide them people to actually use the system better. And so the Legal Defense Fund dedicated ourselves to providing free legal services to these community organizations. And as you can imagine, if you hold out your shingle and it says free legal services in an environment in which legal services cost a couple thousand dollars an hour, that the uh, office quickly filled up. People lined up around the corner like it was concert ticket time. And our phone rang off the hook. And eventually, about a year or two out of law school, we had over 300 organizational clients across the state of Pennsylvania. And these were folks fighting every conceivable type of project, from chip mills to you know, tire cookers and incinerators and all those types of things. And the calls would, into our office would always start the same way. We would get a call from a community organization, call into the office, and they would say, we're from XYZ in rural Pennsylvania. And they would say, we, there's a proposal for a 10,000 head hog factory farm for our community. And they would say, we don't want it. Right? We want to say no to it. We just don't want it in our community. Our concept of sustainable agriculture doesn't include a 10,000 head hog factory farm smack in the middle of the community. To which we, as learned environmental lawyers, would relay to them the information that is the basis of some of our foundation of law in the United States, which is that communities, like the ones that were calling us, are prohibited from banning legal uses. Okay? should sound familiar because there's been a series of court decisions in Colorado that uphold that same principle. Communities are prohibited from banning legal uses. 
Okay? It's black letter law. You ask the environmental lawyers, they'll tell you the same thing as the corporate lawyers. It's been that way for 150 years. So communities are banned from prohibiting illegal uses. What's illegal use? Well, it's anything the state deems to be illegal use. When you have a permit issued and a regulatory agency that issues permits, the permits get issued, it becomes a legal use under the law. That's how it's defined as a legal use. What are some legal uses? Well, low-level radioactive waste sites, legal use. Fracking, legal use. Oil and gas extraction, legal use. Uh, you name it, pretty much everything has been defined as a legal use by the courts or by the regulatory agencies through the issuances of permits. So communities are banned from prohibiting a legal use. You know, it's black letter law. And usually when I give these talks, somebody says, that's not true. We have zoning ordinances. And zoning ordinances, we have land use stuff. And we can ban legal uses. Well, not quite. Zoning ordinances were put in place to actually separate out incompatible land uses from each other. So you have commercial, you have industrial, you have residential. But if you attempt to use zoning ordinances to actually ban a legal use, the next thing you're looking at is a corporation filing a lawsuit against your municipality for violating the corporation's constitutional rights. Okay, and we're going to get to that concept next. Uh, but that's how the law is set up. Essentially, you have to decide which area of your municipality you're going to sacrifice under the zoning ordinance because you have to allow the legal use into some part of the municipality. That's how the law functions. So when we were on the phone with the community groups, we would relay this to the community organizations, and they would say, oh, well, that's, that really sucks, right? So what can we do? And we said, we're so happy you asked because that's what we specialize in, right? We said for that factory farm to go in, in that community where you're calling from, they need a permit, right? They need a permit issued by the Department of Environmental Protection that certifies, in this case, that they would not be putting too much liquid manure on every acre of ground that they were actually planning to put in at the factory farm. And we said, we, as your lawyers, we can go in and argue that the permit never should have been issued, that it was issued wrongly by the agency, because that's what environmental law is today. It's actually about going in, taking the regulations themselves, taking the corporate permit application, and then figuring out if there's an inconsistency, a discretion, an omission, something's missing, those types of things between the two. That's what environmental law is today. Almost 100% of it is, is that. And so we would tell the community group, you know, we're happy to do that, happy to come in, look at the permit, compare the regulatory stuff with the permit stuff, and then appeal the permit for you. And so they'd retain us, and we would go into court. And we were in court, we, after re re going through the regulations and the corporate permit application, that kind of thing, so we would find arguments. Like, for example, corporate permit applications in Pennsylvania dealing with landfills, you have to post a certain bond, a financial bond of a certain amount to fix the roads if the roads get screwed up by the trucks coming in and out of the, uh, of the facility. It's kind of common sense. We would find permit applications that didn't have the correct bond amount. Certain applications had to be signed by the president of the corporation that was submitting the application. And we would find out, lo and behold, only the secretary signed the application, okay? Or that there needed to be a study appended to the application, but the study was old. So it was 20 years old, they needed to do a new one, et cetera, et cetera. So we would end up in a room arguing with an administrative law judge. And the arguments would go somewhat like this. Your honor, under section little two, little c, little i, little d, little two, little roman numeral two, little i, little c, little i, little e, little two that the bond that was posted just wasn't, wasn't sufficient and the agency never should have issued the permit. Or your honor under a separate section, the wrong signature, whatever, whatever. And the judge most of the time would agree with us because we had found some kind of gap or omission or deficiency in the permit application. And the judge would overturn the permit issuance, right? So what would happen next is that the community group, who was very happy at that point in time because they had gone through the process and actually won something at the end, would have a victory party back at the house of one of the lead organizers. And they'd invite us over and we'd go over and they'd you know, have beer and wine, and peanuts, and everybody would pat themselves on the back and they'd say things like, the system works, right? We had a problem in our community. We used the established avenues of activism. We appealed the permit, we found the lawyer. The lawyer was, eh, he was bright. And the judge decided not to decide to overturn the permit. And now we're not gonna get the, the factory farm anymore. Right? Well, what would happen two months, three months, sometimes 30 days afterwards is that the corporate boys would come back and they'd come back with a new and improved permit application. And what was funny to me this whole time that we were doing this section of the work 
was that I had lawyers from companies like the Waste Management Corporation, you know, big time lawyers, big firms, right? After, the, uh, after we had won in front of the administrative law judge, they would come over to me and actually thank me for finding those gaps, omissions, and deficiencies because it allowed them to bill more to the company to actually find the other information that they needed to add on to the permit application. So they would actually thank me in that process. It happened a number of times. It wasn't just one time they would thank me. And so they would come back with a new and improved permit application at some point. And the community group would come back to us and they'd go, Mr. Lindsay, we need you to do that jujitsu that you did the first time around to get that permit application kicked out. And we were left looking back at them saying, we're sorry, there's nothing we can do for you because now the permit application is complete, right? We, in essence, had done their job for them to make it more complete, right? And the community group would then look back at us and say, well, what do we do next? And we would say, we have no idea. We, we've, done, you know, we've done what we could. There's no levers anymore in the law that we can actually <coughs> exercise or pursue. What would happen three months after that or six months after that? Community would get the factory farm. Community would get the incinerator. Community would get the facility that was originally the subject of the permit application. What was funny to us, and it's not really funny at all, looking back on it, was that we had a win-loss record on paper of like 150 and three, something like that, right? In that we won those cases in front of the administrative law judge, right? They tossed the permit, right? We lost very few of those. Mostly it's just because we had a brain and we had some ethics. And in addition, 90-some percent of permits at issue, nobody challenges at all in the United States because nobody has the resources to challenge them. So 90% of permits just get issued, right? Just by showing up a lot of times was enough to win those permit appeals. So on paper, we had this record of 150 and three dealing with these permit appeals. But if you walked into the communities that we have been representing, you would have seen absolutely no resemblance between the communities that were getting shellacked and our win-loss record on paper. In fact, there's a particular example in Pennsylvania a uh, little community named Chester, just outside of Philadelphia, overwhelmingly African-American community. They had four medical waste incinerators already operating in the community, and there was a permit issued for a fifth, right? For a fifth one, right? We went through the permit stuff, the hamster a wheel crap, and eventually that got permitted as well, to which we began to think to ourselves, what's the point, right? What's the point of any of that at this point? But that didn't stop what I will refer to as the liberal progressive community in the United States from giving us awards. We got awards, we got recognition. Uh, Al Gore's office invited us to the White House uh, where they were celebrating uh, good environmental law firms one year. So we got the awards and recognition, we got some funding with it because it didn't seem that anybody gave a shit what was actually happening in the communities. What they cared about was the win-loss cycle where we were actually enforcing environmental law. We were enforcing environmental law. It didn't matter because the things were going in anyway, right? And that was one of my first realizations. But there were two other things that someone said to me back then which have stuck in my craw ever since. The first one is this. We at least thought we were costing the corporations money, right? Because they got to pay their lawyers. They got to come in. They got to do the permit appeals. They bill out the wazoo for those things, I mean, even for work they don't do. We all know that, right? They ran out the bill. So a lot of money that they're paying for these permit defenses uh, that uh, we were bringing the permit appeals on. The problem is that the monies that they spend on the permit defense, on the lawyers for the permit defense, is all tax deductible. It's tax deductible as a reasonable and necessary business expense under the US tax code, right? So it's structural, it's built in almost in some ways to give them that advantage. And the second thing that someone told to me, her name was Jane Ann Morris. She a uh, corporate historian. She looks at the history of corporations in the United States. She said, the only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmentalists. <laughs> the only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmentalists because they make us predictable as to how we oppose the things coming into our community. You know, the sad little fact, nasty little fact, is that the corporations that are ostensibly supposed to be regulated by the regulations are the ones that actually write them, yeah. right? 
It's a nasty little secret. Sometimes we don't admit it to ourselves. I used to work at the Pennsylvania legislature, actually saw how the agency rulemaking happens, which makes sense. We don't have the wealth and the power to be at those tables. We don't have the wealth and power to carry the conversation at those tables. But the corporate boys do. They write the regulations. And if we think that the corporations are voluntarily going to give us any amount of power at the local level, especially the power to say no, right, which is finally starting to raise up, seep up through the organizing United States today. If we think that they're going to write anything in there voluntarily to give us real power in the communities where those projects are coming in, we are insane. We are crazy. Right? Because the definition of sanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result next time. Why would they ever write anything like that into the regulatory process? And better question is, why the hell do we follow it? Why do we follow it? Right? I mean, that's just, it's insane to me. It's still insane to me today. So we decided to quit. We decided we had better things to do than help corporations build better permit applications, which is what we were doing, helping them. I'd rather work at Kinko's than help corporations build better permits. There's plenty of people out there that can do that stuff. And that's when a new series of phone calls started coming into the office. And the new phone calls were coming from South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Pennsylvania, James Carville once made the joke that on one side of Pennsylvania we have Pittsburgh, on the other side we have Philadelphia, and in the middle we have Mississippi. Right? So South Central Pennsylvania, pretty much the Mississippi of Pennsylvania, right? Not liberal, you know, not liberal progressive, very conservative, Republican, very, very rural areas in the South Central part of the state. Why are we getting phone calls from them? Because the agribusiness corporations who had once fucked up uh, South Carolina and North Carolina in terms of huge factory hog farm operations. And people may remember the hurricane came through those states, uncapped all the manure lagoons. There was a dead zone created off the coast. All that kind of stuff happened. The legislature put a moratorium in place for new facilities. The agribusiness corporations decided to look for a new place to go. And the place they decided to come was South Central Pennsylvania. They wanted to put their stuff in South Central Pennsylvania, but they had a problem. And the problem was about 300 local governments, some of the smallest local governments you can imagine, 300, 400 people in these places, had passed a series of regulations making it too expensive to dispose of liquid hog manure in their municipalities. Basically, they said, if you're going to produce it in our municipalities, you're going to put it in one of these factory farms in, we're going to force you to ship it someplace else to make it prohibitively expensive to actually have the factory farm in our locations. It was the old formula that the environmental folks like to run of, let's make it too expensive. Instead of actually saying no to it frontally, let's just make it more expensive and hope that they go someplace else. Well, the agribusiness corporations came in and said, we don't want to go anyplace else. We like South Central Pennsylvania. In fact, we've already bought land there. And we already have contracts there with folks. And so we really want to be there. So what happened next to the agribusiness corporations, they wrote a law. And the law was called the Nutrient Management Act, right? They gave it to the legislature. They worked with the Ag Committee to, to try to get it through. And the environmental groups in Pennsylvania got on board. They said, oh, this is great, nutrient management. It's about managing nutrients, right? We need one of those laws. We, we need a planning law like that. Next thing you know, the thing goes through the legislature. And I don't know how Colorado is. In Pennsylvania, the legislature in, Pennsylvania, in the state does their best work at 2 in the morning. Right? It was at that point that somebody said in the legislature, which is probably all calculated, they said, hey, it doesn't do any good to have a nutrient management act and a planning law in place if the localities can actually put more stringent things in place that then make it too expensive to comply with the nutrient management act that we're passing. And so they inserted a preemption provision. We all know about preemption. They inserted a preemption provision into the Nutrient Management Act, which overnight, once it was passed, nullified all 300 local ordinances across South Central Pennsylvania, right? All those regulatory manure ordinances got tossed overnight. So you're an elected official in South Central Pennsylvania saying to yourself, I'm being yelled at by 70% you know, of my residents to not allow these factory farms to come in. We had a law. Now we don't have a law anymore. What do we do, right? And so they were, you know, talking about being caught in a vice, they had their, their residents on one hand who were screaming at them to do something. Because if you live within three quarters of a mile of one of these factory farms, you lose 60% of your property value. 
I mean, forget about air pollution, water pollution, all very important things, but just property value alone, you know, you take a real hit. So people were screaming at these elected officials, and the elected officials were turning to their municipal lawyer, and they were saying, hey, how? What do we do about this nutrient management? What can you do? And the lawyer says, you can't do anything. You've been preempted by the state. To which this, the, some of the elected officials said, well, that's pretty shitty, Hal. Why don't you give me a new opinion, something different that I can work with, right? And the supervisors, the elected officials, because they didn't have any other place to go, called us. And they said, we want to do something here to stop these factory farms from coming in. And we, putting on our learned hat, said, well, you know, the state issues permits now for these factory farms. They're a legal use. And communities can't ban legal uses. It's black letter, black letter law in the United States, right? So we delivered it as learned counsel. And the, the phone calls at that point in time started to change from the ones that happened before because the person on the other end of the line then started asking a really, really tough question. It wasn't very complex, but it was very tough. And the question was, why? Why is the law that way, right? And so we would say, well, the law is that way because if you try to ban it and it's a legal use, that the corporation that's affected by your ban can come in and sue you. And the corporation can sue you for violating their constitutional rights. Because corporations have constitutional rights in the United States as persons under the law. They have the same rights as you, right, as a natural person. So Walmart Corporation has the same First Amendment free speech rights, Fourth Amendment unreasonable search and seizure rights, Fifth Amendment due process rights, Fourteenth Amendment uh, 14th Amendment, due process, equal protection rights, Fifth Amendment, takings rights. I mean, all those constitutional rights have now accrued to the corporate form. So we would say, well, corporations have rights, and they can sue you because the permit that's given by the state is treated by the law as property. It's property. It has a value. The permit itself has value. It can be sold and bought, all kinds of transferred. It has value. Under the Fifth Amendment, you can't take property without compensating the entity whose property has been taken. It's called the takings clause. Corporations use it all the time. They sue municipalities and say, you've taken my property. You owe me money. And because the municipality doesn't have money to pay the corporation, the municipality usually rescinds whatever they've passed, the ordinance or the decision or whatever they you know, put in place. Welcome to democracy in America. So we would explain that to these folks who would say, well, that's the situation. You get sued because corporations have constitutional rights. And you know, get silent on the other end of the line for a couple minutes, a couple seconds, and then the other end of the line would say, why? <laughs> and we would say, well, it goes back to the 1840s, 1850s. Corporations were given constitutional rights by the US Supreme Court, and the other federal courts recognized that corporations were persons under the law. And that's where their rights come from. And then the other line of voice on the other end of the phone would say, why? And we'd say, well, you know, the US Constitution kind of protects property and commerce in many ways. It's a, it's a property document. That's what the Constitution is. If you read the Constitution, it has a lot of provisions in it that protect property and commerce. It makes no mention in there about communities or nature or labor or labor unions or African Americans. It doesn't mention any of those things, but it does mention property and commerce, which makes sense. Because when the founders put the Constitution together, what they saw was an endless bounty of natural resources across the horizon. And they said to themselves, if we want to become a major power, like England or France, and not worry about being invaded anymore, that we need to actually turn all those resources into useful stuff. Because that's how we become you know, liberty and progress and capital and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's where it all comes from. So they wrote a document that actually not only allowed that exploitation to happen, but actually mandated that that exploitation happen in some ways by pro providing protections to not only commerce and property at large, but also the actors that use property and commerce. So it's very easy for corporations to become persons under the law because the Constitution set up a fertile environment for them to do so. After all, if you're already protecting property and commerce, it makes sense to protect the primary actors of property and commerce, which today is the United States corporation, corporate form. So we would explain this to these folks on the phone, whoever called in, and they would say, why? And we'd say, well, the US Constitution comes from English common law, right? And English, it's very exciting stuff. And English common law, right, was built and constructed entirely 
to allow England to take this structure of law to colonize other places. That's what English common law did. Common law was about property and commerce elevated above the rights of people, communities, and nature, and then actually England shipped it overseas. In fact, it came into the United States through the early American colonies. The early American colonies were corporations. So Rhode Island was a corporation. Virginia was a private corporation. South Carolina was a private corporation. We all began in our states, at least on the eastern seaboard, as private companies. Amazing thing about the American Revolution is it transferred private companies to, into constitutionalized states. That was a huge leap to make. But they started as private companies. So we would say, you know, this goes back to English common law and that structure of law that got transferred into the colonies as private companies. That's where it all comes from. And they would say, why? And we would say, I don't know. Maybe God said so. I, we, don't, we don't know anymore. In fact, I really got to be going. We got to go grab lunch. Uh, so sorry to get off the phone with you folks. But anyway, what that conversation was about, those why, 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 eventually became our democracy schools about exploring why each of those is true and taking people through the history to understand why we live in the place that we live uh, and how the laws actually function. The US Constitution of the United States is the DNA under which the system operates. It's the default. So everything built on top of it has to respect the DNA that's built into that US constitutional stuff. So leaving that aside for now, how did we begin to assist these communities? Because we made a decision to assist them. Well, we said to them, your problem is not factory farms, right? Your problem is not factory farms. Your problem is the agribusiness corporations, right? Your problem is not factory farms. In fact, your problem is not water pollution or odor pollution or anything like that. It's actually the agribusiness corporations. And it's the fact that you don't have a democracy because you can't decide what happens in your own community. It's like in Colorado, it's not a fracking problem, it's a democracy problem. You don't have the power to decide what happens in your own communities. It doesn't matter what you want. If you think fracking's bad, who gives a shit? You don't have the power to get it. You don't have the power to make a law that sticks because the law itself doesn't even recognize you as a community able to make law, right? These folks are stuck in the same position. So we said, your problem is not the factory farms. Your problem is the agribusiness corporations and the power that they assert, because the agribusiness corporations have now defined what farming is going to be in your community. They've defined what allowable farming is going to be in your community, and they've defined factory farming and industrial processes as farming. You got to take that back. So they said, how do we do that? I said, I don't know, but it sounds good. And so we began searching the country for different ways that people have changed their activism away from fighting the symptoms of the problem and instead beginning to get at the structure of the problem, right? In the United States today, we have a corporatization of agriculture that's occurred. We've lost 300,000 farmers in the last 15 years. And people say, oh, we lost them. You know, like we can't find them. We don't know where they went. Let's look under the covers. Well, they've been driven out of business by this corporatization of agriculture. Four companies own 70% of pork production in the United States today. Five companies own 80% of hog production in the United States today. One company owns 60% of cheese production in the United States. Anybody know who that is? Kraft. Kraft, yes. And so we have an issue with centralization, corporatization of agriculture, because the type of agriculture that the corporations foresee as efficient and, and actually to scale, which are the words that they use, are much different than the type of agriculture that our communities envision, right? One is roughly sustainable, and one is roughly unsustainable. If the agribusiness corporations have the legal authority to force their vision of what agriculture should be into our communities, we're going to end up with unsustainable agriculture. It's an A plus B plus C equation, right? That's as straight line as it gets. So we started looking across the country because we knew we weren't the smartest bulbs in the pack, that somebody else had actually come to that conclusion as well. And sure enough, they had in South Dakota, Believe it or not, a coalition of farmers, activists, environmentalists had come together to draft something called Amendment E to the South Dakota Constitution. What did Amendment E say? It banned corporations from farming in the state of South Dakota. It's known as the anti-corporate farming law. Now, why was that important? Well, it's because somebody switched gears, you know? Somebody switched gears away from, hey, we need to regulate the odor pollution or the water pollution coming from these things. And instead, we need to go after the corporations themselves. And so what they did was they drafted this law, anti-corporate farming law. It allowed family farm corporations to use the incorporation process to protect themselves. 
uh, but took the big agribusiness corporations out of business. That's what the anti-corporate farming law did. We were amazed to find it. We were even more amazed to find that nine states in the Midwest had adopted something similar over chicken farms and hog farms. Who's heard, who's, who's heard of these in this room? Anti-corporate farming laws. All right, well, Libby, obviously. <laughs> anyway, we had no idea. We didn't know agriculture from Shinola, but it sounded to us like a new, a new way. We knew that the old ways were done. They were cooked. You couldn't do anything with it, so we tried a new path. And we drafted the first anti-corporate farming law for a municipality in the state of Pennsylvania. So we took it local. We did the anti-corporate farming stuff, and we took it local in an ordinance. And didn't know if anybody had the wherewithal to actually adopt it, but we sent it out there. A little place called Wells Township. That's where all this started. 490 people. A little place called Wells Township. Slated for five new hog factory farms in Wells Township. It's a little place, right? So they got together at a meeting. They passed the anti-corporate farming law, right? Said, we're not going to allow corporations to farm here. The agribusiness corporation said, if you don't want us, we're going to go someplace that will. And they moved next door, right? But they actually moved their facilities. They moved their plans for the facilities out of Wells Township into areas next door. So we chased them next door. And we started working with municipalities to start within that county to actually make more and more ground off limits through these anti-corporate farming laws. Anti-corporate farming laws then spread across Pennsylvania until there were about a dozen of them in north central PA, south central PA, eastern PA, western Pennsylvania. There were very early versions of the Lafayette rights-based ordinance, for example, and the other ones that have been passed. So when you talk about Lafayette, you know, you owe your existence to a little place called Wells Township and a chairman named Kevin Bricker, uh, who I think never graduated from high school. Uh, and so that's where it all started, this little revolt in Pennsylvania. What happened next was we were basically keeping busy with trying to get this stuff out to people and talk with them and explain to them the issues, that we had a problem with land applied sewage sludge uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, sewage sludge, not a good issue to talk about before dinner, it's okay to talk about it after dinner. Sewage sludge is anything that goes into a centralized sewage treatment plant. The brain surgeons that we had uh, regulating sewage sludge uh, back in the 1970s decided it was a good idea to truck or pipe all of our sewage sludge and dump it off the coast of New Jersey. All right. Anybody who's been in New Jersey may think that wasn't a bad idea. But anyway, so all the stuff got uh, dumped off the coast of New Jersey. What's in it? It's everything that goes into the waste stream. It's, you know, uh, it's a hospital waste, it's industrial waste. There's all kinds of stuff that ends up in that waste stream. It can contain over 100,000 different toxic contaminants, especially coming out of the industrial areas. Needless to say, when it was dumped <laughs> off the coast, it created a huge dead zone off the coast, which is what happens when you dump shit and toxics into the ocean. So the folks that came up with the brain surgery plan of dumping it in the ocean then came up with another plan backed by the Environmental Defense Fund and NRDC, two of the largest environmental organizations in the United States. Their brainy idea was to allow for land application of sludge. So now sludge that comes out of sewage treatment plants is actually applied to farmland where we grow crops for both human and livestock consumption, can contain all kinds of chemicals in it. We've had several kids die after breathing in the contaminants who live next door to the fields. Cornell University tracks you know, 400 illnesses and deaths across the United States that have happened from the land application of sewage sludge. Needless to say, most of the sludge in Pennsylvania is produced by Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. They hire private companies like Cinegro Corporation. They pay them with public monies to haul it into the countryside to give it for free to farmers right, as a replacement for chemical fertilizer, right, that's the way they sell it. They say it's free fertilizer, you don't have to pay for chemical fertilizer anymore, we're going to dump it on your property. I have to say my last uh, shred of any hope for uh, the state environmental uh, regulatory agency, which in Pennsylvania it's called the DEP, uh, most of our folks call it the Department of Everything Permitted, uh, is that they began to arrange meetings, meet and greets, they like to call them, between the farmers and the sludge corporations to try to build the area, the ground, and the land to actually haul the sludge. So they would have meet and greets where they would actually get the two, the two entities together. Needless to say, in Pennsylvania, a lot of people were not happy uh, for being shit on by Philadelphia. So Philadelphia was sending their stuff out into rural Pennsylvania. And uh, in rural Pennsylvania has no political power. It's so sparsely populated that if you want to run for governor and uh, you don't have to campaign in 64 of the 67 counties. 
because there's enough population in the metro centers to actually get you elected. So they have no political power in the rural, most rural parts of the state of Pennsylvania. They turned to us and said, hey, we heard about these anti-corporate farming laws. We'd like to actually use them to stop sludge from coming in. These corporations that have 70% of sludge hauling industry in the United States, we want to stop them from coming in. So we said, sure, and we worked with them to draft an anti-corporate sludging ordinance. That was first passed by 10, then 20, then 50, then 70. We were up to 86 municipalities at one point that had passed these ordinances that targeted the corporations, not targeting the, regula the regulatory stuff or the symptoms of those facilities coming in. What was fascinating to me at that point is that we reached a critical mass of like 100 ordinances. So this is out of uh, 1,400 townships. Uh, probably about 10% of the rural municipalities in Pennsylvania had passed our ordinances at that point. And as everybody knows, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? And most times when you're dealing with some of the largest waste management and agribusiness corporations on the planet, the reaction is often not equal, but very unequal. What they did next was to head off these ordinances. They actually went to Governor Rendell, a Democrat. This might start to sound familiar. Governor Ed Rendell, uh, and they presented him with a bill, and the bill was called ACRE. Uh, it's called Agriculture, Community, and Rural Environment. Everybody's sitting down for this, but the ordinances became such a threat to the state legislature in Pennsylvania that they adopted this bill called ACRE, which allowed the agribusiness and sludge corporations to pick up the phone and file an oral complaint with the Attorney General's Office of the state to which the Attorney General's office would dispatch one of their assistant Attorney Generals to sue the municipality to overturn the ordinances. Okay? So just to cover that one more time, public taxpayer money being put at the, at the uh, lap uh, disposal of the agribusiness corporations who wouldn't have to even use their private lawyers anymore to sue to overturn the ordinances, but could call the Attorney General's office and the Attorney General would come in and actually sue the municipality to overturn the ordinance, right? Now, up to that point in time, we had been talking with people about how the problem was not the corporations necessarily. Because, you know, we, a lot of people like to talk about bad corporate, oh, it's a bad corporation you're paying face. Corporations can't do anything without the power of your government, which has been bestowed upon them. Corporate rights, for example, have been given to them by the state and federal governments. Preemption is created on their behalf by the state government. Your, you know, the Colorado Oil and Gas Association lawsuit dealing with preemption in these different communities. The state serves it up like a tennis ball, you know, like the beginning of a match. They say, here's the power, and then the corporations come in and they use the power to strike down whatever local communities are passing. So our, our conversation with folks in rural Pennsylvania was always about, it's not just the corporation, it's your own government. It's your own government that's the problem. It's your own structure of government that's the problem. And people always said, oh, no, that's not true. You know, it's just the corporation coming in, and that's who we have to face. And it's not the government, it's, not the, it's just the corporation. Until they got sued, you know, under Acre. You had assistant attorney generals showing up at municipal buildings, right? Making speeches saying, if you don't repeal this ordinance, the state is going to sue you. It's not going to be Waste Management Corporation versus the municipality. It's going to be the state of Pennsylvania versus the municipality, using your taxpayer monies to sue yourself, right? That's the situation in Pennsylvania. And we knew something different was happening when the first, one of the first times in our, one of our municipalities, the Assistant Attorney General came in and said, gave his little speech about, you know, we're going to sue you and blah, blah, blah that the women in the community, which made up the citizens group who had passed an anti-sludge ordinance in the municipality, actually physically went up to him, grabbed one arm on either side, and escorted him out of the building, right? And so the capital, you know. The Harrisburg Patriot News, the main uh, newspaper, capital newspaper in Pennsylvania, had a photographer there and actually captured it. You know, these, these women escorting the assistant attorney general out, saying, thank you very much. We don't need your help here. We've passed an ordinance. We, we don't like sludge here. We passed an ordinance that banned sludge. Please go back to Harrisburg. We don't need you here. Yeah. Next day, the Attorney General's office sued the municipality, right, in the name of the state. And count number one was, there is no inalienable right to local self-government, 
right, in an attempt to nullify the ordinance, saying there's no power base here, there's no authority here of the people to pass anything. This was the Attorney General's brief. There is no right to local community self-government. It's point one in the brief. So what happened next? Well, next door was a little place called Packer Township. And Packer Township was watching what happened to this other township with the Assistant Attorney General coming in. So they passed an ordinance in their community refusing to recognize the authority of the Attorney General to set foot in their municipality, right? And so things started to escalate, right? And things started to get very interesting in Pennsylvania. Uh, as the work in Pennsylvania began to churn out, began to accelerate and expand, and duplicate and replicate, people talking about different things and talking about corporations, we had a community that said to us, well, if the issue is corporations and corporate rights, in other words, we can pass these ordinances all we want, but we're going to get sued by either the state or the private corporation for violating their rights, we need to actually start doing something about that. And we were like, well, yeah, but what are you going to do about that, right? It's one thing to, to you know, take the pig by the tail, you know, pull the tail a little bit. It's a whole other thing to, to start talking about you know, rights and powers that are embedded in the system. Who are you at the local level to take those on kind of thing? And they said, would you help us? And we said, with what? And they said, we want to draft an ordinance that refuses to recognize corporate constitutional rights within our municipality. Right? First reaction from us is, you can't do that. Right? It's the same reaction you get from people here sometimes. You can't do that. You can't pass that. Well, we went back to the office and we drafted it up. It's called the Corporate Rights Elimination Ordinance. Right? We didn't know if the rebellion had reached a state where people were willing to actually engage in something like that. But sure enough, little community uh, in Clarion County, just above Pittsburgh, had a meeting, had a discussion, had people testify about the power of corporations in their community. It's a community of 600 people, not liberal progressive, by the way, much different, uh, and passed, it, passed that ordinance unanimously, becoming the first community in the United States to refuse to recognize corporate constitutional rights within their municipality. A week later, the community next door did the same. And then those ordinances started to travel throughout the state. And then people started questioning preemption. How democratic is preemption, right? You're pulling decision-making power away from a larger number of hands to a smaller number of hands located somewhere distant from the community that's affected by the decision that's being made. How democratic is preemption? on the front, right? And so that started to get mixed into the ordinances as well. This open, direct, frontal confrontation of legal doctrines that have basically been accepted by the legal profession for the last 150 years, that these folks in rural Pennsylvania, some without a high school education, most who drive road crews for a living to clear the roads in the wintertime and patch the roads in the summertime, these folks had the gall to actually think that they could begin to take on those fundamental legal doctrines that exist in this country. Not because they said, hey, next Wednesday we'd like to pick a fight with the largest corporations on the planet, but because they said, we can't stop sludge or factory farms from coming into our communities unless we deal with those doctrines. Because if you try to deal with the issue itself, those doctrines come back to bite you. You actually have to take them out. And change in that respect, which I'm going to get to in a minute, does not come from writing letters to Congress, right? We laugh about that, but, you know, dear Congressman, dear Congressman Polis, <laughs> dear Jared, is that his name? Yeah. We would so like for you to strip corporations of constitutional rights in the United States. And we'd like that to happen next week because we're thinking about putting an ordinance in place today, right? We write letters to Congress. We do all of the traditional activist stuff that we do. But we know in our hearts that this kind of change, this is radical, paradigm-shifting, structural change, is not going to come from the existing political institutions. It's only going to come from below. And we only have so many examples of that happening in the United States over the past 150 years. You got the populist farmers in the late 1800s. You got the suffragists. You got the abolitionists. You got the civil rights movement. You got the American Revolution. And that's basically about it in terms of the type of wholesale structural change that we're talking about. And that's pretty scary. But the one lesson that comes out of all those places is that it comes from the grassroots. And it comes from people who are unwilling to obey a system of law that guarantees that they get harmed. Right? That's the key. But it comes from below. 
All of our activism pretty much in the environmental circles and the traditional labor circles and everything else is all about activism up here. It's all about begging and pleading someone to do something at these levels for us, which we in our heart of hearts I think know is not going to happen. There's a great quote from a guy named Derek Jensen. Uh, and he focused, Derek Jensen is an author in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, he writes about how we're destroying nature and in destroying nature in many ways we're destroying ourselves. I mean that's the kind of stuff that he writes. And he likes to take on the people that say, well, all we have to do is change ourselves. We, this is all about personal change, not necessarily political change. We just have to change the way we live, and we have to change the light bulbs that we use and buy Priuses and do the personal change stuff. He said, that's like the French resistant fight, resistance fighters vowing to stop Hitler by composting. <laughs> right? right? So we need a different kind of mindset. And a lot of people talk about these ordinances, oh, that's a legal strategy or that's a lawyer's thing. It's really not. I mean, we help to put the language in place, but, but the value of it is that it, it happens and that people vote or that municipal officials vote to put something in place. It's actually a frontal challenge to the structure of law that we have. It's a different way of thinking about stuff. The ordinances are just ink on paper. It's just a, it's, uh, the indication that something different is happening up here in a majority of people within a particular community. That's what the ordinances are. That's what the charter amendments are. That's what all that stuff is. It's just an indication. That indication, that, that change in psyche about making our activism commensurate with the problems that we face today, actually changing our activism to make it commensurate with the problems we face today, is something that's starting to sweep. And I couldn't make that statement three years ago, but it's starting to actually catch like an infectious disease uh, as, as it goes across the country. Um, in New Hampshire, they're working now to, of course, stop the water bottling operations, uh, but they're also working to stop things like uh, east-west highways. They're stopping power lines that are dropping down through the rural part of New Hampshire. Uh, in Ohio, they're working to stop fracking. There's a couple of fracking initiatives on the ballot uh, this November. Those communities are starting to freak the Ohio legislature out, which passed a new preemptive bill last year to specifically stop those communities from passing those types of ordinances. In Washington State, we have the city of Spokane, uh, where for the first time, uh, at least in Spokane, you had labor unions coming together with neighborhood groups, coming together with environmental organizations to propose a community bill of rights for the city of Spokane that would actually recognize labor rights in the workplace, because today when you walk into a private workplace, you lose your constitutional rights. You have no First Amendment or Fourth Amendment rights in the workplace, in a private workplace. Um, they also voted to put forward a, this initiative that would have recognized that the Spokane River has rights this concept of the rights of nature, that nature has rights that can be enforced by the people of the community. Uh, and the final one, which was that neighborhoods within the city would have the legal authority to stop Walmart and other big box and other corporations that were doing development in their communities. It freaked the hell out of the Spokane City Council and the Chamber of Commerce who brought a suit to try to keep it off the ballot. All kinds of interesting fights emerging over these types of ordinances. In Oregon, you have three counties uh, in the central part of the state. Uh, who are putting on the ballot community bills of rights that ban GMOs uh, within their communities, ban the growth, transportation, distribution of genetically modified seeds and organisms within those counties. And of course, the two biggies, which are the city of Pittsburgh, which unanimously, it still blows my mind to say this, but three years ago, the city of Pittsburgh, we worked with the city council to adopt an ordinance that bans oil and gas extraction within the city of Pittsburgh. It also strips oil and gas corporations of certain constitutional rights within the city of Pittsburgh and recognizes that the rivers that run through the city of Pittsburgh have rights of their own, ecosystem rights within the city. It was adopted unanimously by the city council of Pittsburgh. That to me is, is that floored me uh, when the votes came back in. Uh, in addition, Mora County, I mentioned Mora County, New Mexico, first county in the United States to ban hydrocarbon extraction. Uh, within their county, and also to strip out oil and gas corporations' constitutional rights, and to nullify preemption of the state uh, if the uh, for the state oil and gas law against the local uh, municipality. About 180 communities, uh, Lafayette joined uh, those 180 uh, last year when they passed the Community Bill of Rights as part of their charter amendment. Um, all in all, what this points up, of course, this need for structural change. Uh, indicates to us at least that we're stuck in a box. We call it the box of allowable remedies. 
the community is in the middle of the box, smack dab in the middle, and the sides of the box are defined by different legal doctrines. So on the top side of the box, you have corporate personhood rights, which actually define what the community can or can't do. And if you jump out of the box, it actually punishes you for doing so. Through lawsuits, you know, you violate corporate rights. On the other side of the box is something we call corporate non-personhood rights, like the Commerce Clause in the Constitution that protects corporations as entities of commerce. Basically, they use the Commerce Clause more often than they use corporate personhood rights to strike down municipal laws. But that's the other side of the box. The third side of the box is preemption, which we're all familiar with. You know, the state can preempt, the state can, if the state authorizes, the communities can't prohibit. That was the language used by what's her name in the most recent Lafayette court decision. And then the fourth side of the box is something called Dillon's Rule, which is a flip side of preemption, which says, if the state hasn't told you specifically in your municipality that you can adopt a certain ordinance, you can't. That's the default. The default is it's prohibited unless you've been given specific authorization to do so. At the Legal Defense Fund, we think that that box has to be nullified. That those doctrines, in order to liberate the community to actually lawmake in the name of environmental and economic sustainability, has to take on those doctrines. And those doctrines have to be democratically taken on. In other words, communities voting not only to ban fracking, but communities to nullify preemption to nullify corporate rights, to nullify Dillon's rule as violating their right to local community self-government, that those doctrines have to be taken out. It's not enough to play around in that box anymore. And in fact, the walls of the box are starting to close in as well. You saw it with the Citizens United decision, corporate First Amendment rights, striking campaign finance laws. You saw it in Hobby Lobby where they found that corporations could have re religious convictions that would allow them to strike down a law. Those walls are continuing to close, close in. And so playing within the box anymore doesn't look that attractive to a lot of people because there's so little that you can get out of that box at this point. Our suggestion is to explode the box, right? <laughs> to frontally, directly call it out and then actually disobey it. Because we think that the only change that has made any difference in this country is really that civil disobedience. When people stop obeying the law, we don't think that there's anything more powerful or powerful enough to make the change that we need other than that. You know, a lot of people have said, you know, when they look at our ordinances and the local laws and legal enactments, they say, what's the point, right? Because you're going to pass it and then the courts are going to come in and the corporation is going to get the courts to come in and overturn it. And the answer is, so few people in this country actually understand how the system actually functions, right? We didn't for the nine or 10 years that we practiced conventional environmental law. I had no idea how the system functioned and I was a lawyer you know, had supposedly gone through the good law school and uh, knew the business, but very few people understand how the system actually operates. You have no rights within your municipality at all. In other words, the system of law doesn't recognize you as a resident of your municipality as a governing institution. Your municipality is seen as a creature of the state, that the state created it and the state can control it the state can abolish it. Tomorrow, if the state decided to abolish the municipal corporation that is Lafayette, they have the power to do so. It's what started, started to happen in Michigan uh, with the bankruptcy receiver that came in uh, and started talking about eliminating municipalities. Your municipal corporation can be eliminated at will. It can be taken away at will because it's a creature of the state as seen under the law. That's pretty terrifying to people. Folks may not believe me. Uh, but even the author of the rule called Dillon's Rule said, it's not even necessary that your elected officials be elected. If the state chose to appoint your officials within your municipality, it's within their power to do so. You are a wholly held subsidiary of the state. And it was funny, when we went through this in one of the democracy schools that we did for First Nations peoples, the, you know, we had some white folks in the democracy school, we had the First Nations indigenous people, and the, one of the First Nations women uh, put up her hand. She said, I feel really bad. And we said, what do you mean? She goes, I feel bad for the white people. And I said, why is that? She goes, because at least we know we live on a reservation. <laughs> so you're right. Let's do something with that. So uh, one of the other thing that we get, and I'm going to finish up with this, is that, you know, uh, we, we have a reputation of not playing nice 
with other groups sometimes, with established traditional environmental organizations, less so with labor groups, because labor groups are a lot more confrontational than the environmental organizations have become. I still have a lot of peers and colleagues in other environmental groups, some of the major environmental organizations were litigating the Mora case, Mora County case, with someone from the New Mexico Environmental Law Center, and so the, and the NRDC is starting to work with us a little bit, but it's only by coming onto our turf, understanding that the community rights stuff is something that they need to actually invest time and energy in. We, we hear it a lot that this work is too much too soon. It's too confrontational, it's too direct, it's too much, it's too quick. And we, we started looking at the history of this country in that when real movements started to arise, uh, like the suffragists. What we don't talk about is that the young suffragists, like the Alice Pauls, had to come in and elbow what she called the old biddies out of the way. Because <laughs> the old biddies were busy with petitions to the president asking the president to be in support of suffrage. But they weren't confrontational, they weren't direct. And the Alice Paul gang had to come in and actually make it so. They had to elbow them out of the way. Sometimes politely, some not politely at all. But to actually displace their method of activism with a different one. And their conversations were always about, your activism is not working. It was based on the strategy. It wasn't personal, it wasn't calling out people individually, but saying, we need to replace that activism with a more direct one. So Alice Paul led the hunger strikes and the pickets out front of the White House. And she got arrested and they got thrown into labor camps. It was a very nasty period in this country's history. There are a lot of those. Uh, but it was a more direct activism. They had to do some of the elbow space to get the others out of the way. The abolitionists had to do the same thing. William Lloyd Garrison, one of the leading abolitionists, uh, at the time of the rise of the abolitionists themselves, you had a group called the American Colonization Society, called the ACS. It was the leading anti-slavery group in the United States. What was the plan of the ACS? Raise money and send freed African Americans to Liberia. Because they said, we can't integrate them here because they're not really people. But we're willing to pay for them to move to Liberia and other colonies. They sopped up all of the money, all the resources, everybody who wanted to give money to be you know, anti-slavery causes. They were essentially a sponge that was not only taking up the resources, but also taking all the air out of the room so that no other conversation could be had. That the abolitionists were too radical, were so radical they were over here, yet come over here, this is a comfortable place to be, it's not so radical, we're just about shipping these fellows and women off to Liberia. Well, William Lloyd Garrison had to go and take them apart. In England, he traveled to England, and in England, he, they had a debate. And in the debate, he ripped the ACS apart uh, and basically killed them off as an organization. It wasn't nice, but it was the elbow throwing that had to happen. The American revolutionaries. Uh, some people call the American Revolution actually a civil war, the, the, the first civil war in the United States, because the war was really against the uh, revolutionaries, the patriots, and the Tories, the folks that wanted to remain under British rule. And so the two went at each other in lots and lots of fora. When the British came in, it was really to support the Tories, to actually support and protect them within the United States. All kinds of elbows, all kinds of guns, all kinds of violence, uh, because stuff had to be moved out of the way. It was the difference between effective activism and ineffective activism. So today we have a lot of ineffective groups we have a lot of groups who raise tremendous amounts of resources to actually take people through the regulatory hamster wheel, right? Down that permit appeal stuff and direct your dollars here, or sign a petition here, or write a letter to congressman here. It's all you hear when it comes to traditional environmental activism. We have to be nice, but we have to be firm and we actually have to understand what's happening, which is every time they do a permit appeal, they're validating the very system that many communities now understand is the problem itself. And that can't be allowed to continue. You actually have to take them on. And it becomes a discussion and debate about strategy, and it becomes very pointed, and it can become very confrontational. Um, and the point, the place, the reason why I arrived at that point was that I had a meeting with one of the largest environmental organizations in the United States. And I talked to them about this corporatization of agriculture stuff. And the executive director of the environmental organization said to me, he said, We'd like it if only one corporation controlled all pork and chicken production in the United States because it's easier to regulate one corporation. And so I've seen that inside stuff other people have as well. But we need to actually go at it. You know? And what happened with Congressman Polis, the Food and Water Watch stuff that transpired, uh, all that kind of stuff we have to call out. 
Because when we don't, it just becomes the same old validation of the same old tired system. Where is all this headed? This is where I'll end. Uh, is that today we have eight states that community rights networks have formed within. Uh, they are Maine, New Hampshire, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Colorado, New Mexico, Washington, Oregon. Those states are now working on state constitutional change stuff with an understanding like the Colorado Community Rights Network, uh, which uh, its assembly met uh, today, whose meeting we were at, that these doctrines need to first be pulled out at the state level. The good news is that things like preemption are state-based. Right now, the federal government doesn't preempt fracking, for example. It's not a direct federal local thing. It's a state local thing. You can actually take that out from the state government's powers by adopting a constitutional amendment. That's what Initiative 75 seeks to do here in Colorado. Um, other problems are more complicated. Corporate rights are not just embedded in your state constitution and by your state courts, but also by the federal courts and federal law. So to pull those out, you have to do it at the state level, but you also have to eventually do it at the federal level. We have given birth to an organization called the National Community Rights Network, which is meeting next month, end of next month, to actually talk about changes to the US Constitution that have to be made in this country. Because it's much deeper than the state constitutional stuff. It's much deeper than the statutory stuff. It's got to go all the way through. What we're talking about is a fundamental uh, overhaul of how our system of law operates. It is in every respect a revolt that was first led by communities, will probably be led by communities in the end. But it's not championed by anybody important. <laughs> So one thing to keep in mind, that all the important people are against it. You talk to law professors, they can't do it. Uh, you talk to judges, oh, can't do it. You talk to elected officials, yeah, can't do it. So you can't expect any support from the existing institutions. The existing institutions are the last ones to change. So instead of that, you're on your own. Uh, and everybody in the other states are on their own until they join together, of course, and build a real movement of the likes that this country has not seen since the late 1800s, at least in my opinion. Thank you.